Welcome to That Digital Take. I'm your host, Tori Webster. Hello, wonderful community. Welcome back. Thank you so much for all of your positive feedback on episode one. We are now officially here kicking into our second episode, which is going to follow our more traditional format. So thank you so much for tuning in. So to kick off, I'm sure you're wondering, Tori, why do you have no voice today? Thank you so much for asking. The reason is because I had a spiritual awakening at the Noah Khan concert on Saturday night. Uh, I actually met a couple of you at the concert at Scotiabank Arena. Thank you for saying hi. You guys are such cuties and so kind. Um, It was truly the best concert. I had the best time. I went with three of my best friends and he just is really, he can put on a show and it's the first time I've seen him live. I was a late, I was a late bloomer to the Noah Khan uh, experience and all my friends went to Budweiser stage last year and I bailed. I didn't go. I, I didn't understand the love affair. I can't believe that blasphemous, but this year I made it. I was actually in the pit. So I have to explain this to you guys because it's actually kind of interesting. So sometimes when I work with brands, instead of them paying for content and instead of them sponsoring posts, they will create opportunities where they know that it's like an epic experience that I would enjoy, whether it's with friends or with other creators. And this was an experience where Spin Genie, which is a brand that I work with all the time, they're um, Ontario's casino that you can get directly on your phone. (laughs) Anyone that knows me knows I love a slot game. This is how I got connected with Spin Genie. That's a story for another day. But anyways, love the brand. Their team is fantastic. And they invited me to go to the Noah Khan concert in lieu of of content, which this is like the really fine line of work and play because I love creating content. Don't get me wrong. But when there's these really, really special experiences in life, like a wedding, for example, there becomes this weird line of like, do I want to turn this into work or do I want to just go have fun? And as I've gotten older, I've gotten a lot better at making that decision. Like, do I turn it into work or do I just go have fun? And I always always weigh the pros and cons, but for Noah, they were offering pit tickets and these tickets, like I I cannot disclose how expensive they were because I feel like that'll just blow everybody's mind, but they were really, really expensive. This is a price I would not have paid myself to go to this concert. Um, And Spin Genie was kind enough to front the cost for the tickets in exchange for content. And I also love the brand. So it was kind of a no brainer this time around. I was like, okay, I absolutely would love to work with you guys. I'd love to shoot content and I'd love to go to the concert. So it worked out. We got seats that were right in the pit. Like I've never been that close for a concert, let alone an artist that I'm absolutely obsessed with. So that was pretty much a bucket list experience. And what also kind of played into that, which was really funny, was one of my great friends works at a a label here in Toronto. And we were having a little pre-party before the concert. And she kind of let it slip that Shawn Mendes was going to come out and perform with Noah. Now, this is kind of like the ins and outs of the industry in the sense that maybe it's like gate kept for the general public, but typically the labels and people behind the scenes know who these like special guest performers are going to be throughout the night. So we kind of got that insider scoop that Sean was going to be coming to the concert and also performing stick season with Noah. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. This is so cool. And as the concert went on, we were like standing in the pit and Sean came out from the wings and just started dancing and like standing behind us in the pit. And I was like, whoa, I mean, here's my take when it comes to famous people in the wild. If it's someone that I truly, truly am obsessed with and have like deep love affair with, I will go up and I will say something. I'm always kind about it and I'm always friendly about it and I try not to be weird. There's no, there's no way to be like, truly chill, but I do try to keep my cool. And I just feel like it's nice to tell people that you love them and that you love their work. So with Sean, um, he knows so many people in my circle, like of friends and colleagues that I I thought it would be way too weird. Like, and all of us truly were just enjoying Noah. So there was no reason to like go say hi or like introduce ourselves. But I, I, a quick aside, I will tell you a funny story of Coachella last year. 
David Dobrik, who does all the vlogs and, you know, was like a famous YouTuber back in his era. Actually, this was like three Coachellas ago. This I didn't go to the last one and then there was COVID. So he was kind of in his prime vlogger era. So I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't give it up. I was like, I have to go say something to him. So I went running through the crowd at Coachella and I went up to him and it was like a private section and like a private party. So it wasn't so weird. But I did go up and I said, I love your work. I love your vlogs. He was really friendly. He, he took it really well and he was really nice about it. So anyways, all that to say, it really depends on the person. Sometimes I will go up and I will say something. Other times I'm just like, they also want to enjoy their experience and have a great time. And for Sean, I'm sure he was just like, he's surrounded by an arena of people that can kind of see him hanging out in the pit. So I can only imagine the amount of iPhones and eyeballs he already has on him. So I just let him enjoy the concert while I kind of had my own chaotic experience with my girlfriends and we got close to the stage and got the best content of Noah. So one more quick thing on that. When we know that there's surprise guests coming out as creators, that's also a level up and a one up for us as content people, because typically the way it works on TikTok, and again, this is not proven, but this is just kind of what I've experienced, is if you're the first person to post a video about that sort of viral moment. So if you're the first person to post about Sean and Noah performing together, typically that's when you kind of kick into that virality because you're the first one on the platform kind of sharing that news. It's almost like, it's like a news break. Like you're the first one sharing that news with the whole world. So that's always like a level up for us as creators when we do kind of have the ins of what's going to happen at the event. And typically we really like that because it means like we're going to be able to create that super viral moment and share it online really quickly. And hopefully pop off. There's been a few instances where that's been the case. There was like, um, an instance this past summer at the Barbie premiere where uh, we knew Ryan Gosling was showing up and all the creators kind of knew that. And so we were excited, but also very prepared to get that content live right away. Because if you're meeting Ryan Gosling, you kind of want to be the first to jump on it. And the same goes for reviews. Like I always say to my brand partners, if I'm invited to a certain event or a certain preview, I want to be the first person to get access to that content. Because to me, that's what's valuable. It's not getting access to shoot it the same day that everybody else gets access to shoot it. I want to be the first one that gets to post it, the first one to go live, the first one to edit it. Um, and again, that kind of goes into social strategy, but just something interesting to note that you guys might be curious about. So back to my weekly recap, what else has gone on in this chaotic week of my life? So hopefully by the time this airs, I've already given you guys this heads up on social, but I'm moving, which guys, adulting, honestly sucks. It's so stressful. There's a million things that I have to do before I move. I also am not a minimalist. I have never claimed to be a minimalist. I am bursting at the seams of my current condo loft and there's items everywhere. And my real estate agent needs all of these items to be out of my house so she can stage my current unit because I'm selling that unit, uh, which quick note on that, by the way. So I bought this unit six years ago. I was 21 when I bought the unit and I'm 27 now that I'm selling it. So really my core young twenties, I've like spent living alone in this beautiful loft that has come to be my like oasis. And it was so funny in my notes for the podcast today, I was writing Goodbye, Carrie Bradshaw era, because she always famously, you know, has her iconic apartment where she just like has her clothes and her <laughs> nothing in her kitchen, which is very on brand for me as well. I have shoes in my oven type vibes. And um, yeah, it's a bit of a bittersweet experience because I'm so excited to be moving and I'm finally moving in with my boyfriend. We've been together for nearly 10 years. And if you follow me on my other platforms, you know, Adam and you see him in my content. And, you know, this was a delayed experience for us in some ways, like we're people that are very career oriented and we spent so much time just kind of building up our careers over the last couple of years and supporting each other through that. But living together was not necessarily the main priority because we liked our lifestyle and we liked the freedoms that we were afforded by living apart. But all that being said, we now are moving into a house together and I'm so excited. It's definitely a brand new chapter 
and something that we're going to explore together. So we're going to decorate together and we're going to renovate together and we're going to do all that fun stuff. But in the interim, I'm living in chaos because now I'm trying to move out of my last unit. I got to move into this new unit. There's a million things going on, but all good things and um, very in line with the universe this year because I had started 2024 by being like, it's a year where I make shit happen and I make things move. And this has definitely been the case, but it's just a little bit stressful. So this is the stuff you don't see online in the very curated uh, life that I portray on social. So, okay, let's head in to our weekly topic. Now, I decided to start with media kits. The reason I wanted to start here is because if you're a creator that wants to get started in the industry, this is probably this is probably where people are going to begin. This is where they're going to begin their journey. They're going to say, okay, I want to start working with brands. I want to start making some money on social. So this would be step one, like creating a kit that basically shows who you are and how you can use this to pitch brands to ultimately create some awesome brand deals. So first let's chat about what you should include in your media kit. I've seen some really good media kits over the years. I've also seen some really bad, ugly media kits over the years. So hopefully this can sort of act as a bit of a checklist of things, in my opinion, are best practice when it comes to sending a brand a media kit. Now, keep in mind, I've been doing this 10 years. So this list of things that I have you know, come to include in my media kit has grown over time and has become more extensive over time. It doesn't mean that you can't just start somewhere. It doesn't need to be overcomplicated. It just needs to be clear. It should be more visual than written, but you definitely want to have some key takeaways and some value adds for brands so they know why they should be choosing to work with you versus working with someone else. So the first thing, high quality images. I highly recommend pulling content from your own social channel. I highly recommend getting photo shoots of curated content for your media kit. You want it to feel professional, but you don't want it to feel like a headshot. Like you don't want it to feel like someone's logged into like an acting headshot. It should feel professional, but it shouldn't feel too stoic or unrelatable. Like it should feel on brand for you. Like if you're someone that does a lot of fashion content, you should make sure that imagery is reflected in that media kit. Like it should be your best work, your best content highlighted in the images that you share in your media kit. Now, some people have media kits that are just one page. Again, you've got to start somewhere. If you think that you don't have enough on your resume per se to create a full PDF file of a million different work, 100% love it. Start with one page. However, the people that in my opinion are doing best practices in the industry, these are people that have between one to 10 pages of you know, content that they're using as a sales pitch. So again, it depends on where you're at in your journey, but I'm just throwing that out there. It doesn't need to just be one page if you can't fit everything on one page. Okay. So number one was the high quality images. Number two, I highly encourage you to include an about me page. Now the about me page should not be too overindulgent, but it should definitely lean into some of your best qualities and some of your best work. If you've had certain experiences in the industry, like for example, I obviously came up in the film and TV world. I include that there just briefly. I don't go into a deep dive of my whole IMDb profile, but you know, I give a, a, a little tidbit of like, this is where I started. This is where I am now. Here's some cool things. Here's some awards I've won. Here's some brands I've worked with. It doesn't need to be crazy, but please introduce yourself, tell the brand who you are and why you feel like you'd be a strong brand partner for them. And again, it can be evergreen. Like this doesn't have to be customized each time you send a pitch, but just evergreen who you are. Tell us about yourself and why you think you're dope because ultimately that's how you're going to get a job. Okay. Number three, please include audience stats and demographics of your audience. This is super important. Brands will look at this on the back end because they typically have access to some third party, um, like tracker brands. So they can, they can pull in your profile. Oh, it's a caveat to this. Don't lie. Don't lie. Brands can pull all the back end of your stats. So, I mean, that should go without saying, but I'm just, just prefacing, like when you're pulling stats and when you're adding your demographics, like make sure that they line up directly with what is linked on Instagram, on meta, on TikTok. 
These are stats that can be pulled with third-party tracker platforms. So the last thing you want to do is have a brand compare what they are pulling on the back end versus what you're saying in your media kit. So make sure you're just giving an honest you know, portrayal of where you're at in your journey and your stats and your audience demo, which is really important, especially if you're doing hyper targeted ads or specifically working with brands, let's say in Toronto, they want to make sure that like Toronto is one of your top cities, for example. So that's why that's important. Okay. So number four, let's make sure that we are including our reach and our impressions in our media kit. Now, reach and impressions on each channel can look different, but I do recommend including screenshots. Like if you go to your TikTok channel and you screen shot on the creator hub, what your current monthly views are or your current post views, that's super valuable for brands. And yes, as I was just mentioning, they are able to pull some stats from the back end from third party programs, but you just want to be transparent. You want to put it out there. You want to show how much success you're creating on your own. And by doing that and showing screenshots, you're really saying, Hey, here it is. I'm being so open about where I'm at. If I'm getting 5 million views a month, I'm being super transparent transparent about that. I'm saying I'm getting 5 million views a month. And those numbers are really exciting for brands to see, but it also just keeps an even playing field. Like they know what to expect when you post, they know what to expect on the back end. So just putting that all up front can be really valuable for brands. Number five, let's be really clear about what channels you are a star on. For example, if you do most of your work on Instagram, let's really highlight your Instagram profile. Let's share some previous work from your Instagram. Let's hyperlink some Instagram content. The same could be true if you have an epic podcast. The same could be true if you have a great YouTube channel. Make sure that you show every single channel that you are popping off on. Even if you're just starting a channel, it's a little bit smaller. Doesn't mean that wouldn't be valuable for a brand to reshare on that channel. So make sure you hyperlink everything and that you have every single channel available. Number six, this brings me to past clients. This is really important if you are someone that has had a lot of experience in the industry. I want to know if you've worked with Disney. I want to know if you've worked with Dyson, with Espresso, Nespresso, (laughs) any brand. I want to know what your previous track record is and if these like high-end global brands love working with you. So, you know, whether it's photos or whether it's hyperlinks, it's great to include your past clients and people that have loved Loved working with you previously because let's be honest, all it takes to get a job is another job. So what you need to know about that is people like to be in good company. They want to make sure that you're working with sick brands and they want to join that train. So disclosing that in your media kit can be an awesome way to create some excitement for brands. Okay, number seven, let's chat about case studies. So this is something that I implemented into my media kit not so long ago, bit a bit more of a trade secret. So I'm, I'm giving you my secrets here. But case studies are really important and cool for brands to look at. So for example, if I've had like an epic, you know, campaign with Tim Hortons for Christmas time, That is a case study that I should then highlight and include in my media kit for multiple reasons. One, it gives future brands an idea of what they can expect when they work with you. So you're including the stats that you pulled for this brand. You're including um, all the social impressions, comments, DMs, anything that is valuable you're including in this case study. It doesn't, again, have to be overindulgent, but if you have three to four awesome case studies of previous work you've done with brands, that can be super valuable in nailing down a future deal. So I highly recommend exploring that. It's something that I was advised to do from a creator that has millions of followers. So again, these are best in class pieces of advice that I truly recommend that you include. That being said, I know a lot of a lot of the comments are going to be like, yeah, well, Tori, guess what? What if I've never had a brand? deal and I can't include case studies. Okay, no worries. Everybody's got to start somewhere. I did not have case studies when I started this 10 years ago. But as you kind of get that first brand deal, get that second brand deal, these are just things that you can keep in your back pocket to include in this future, um, you know, foolproof media kit. So again, take it with a grain of salt. But if it works for you, I highly recommend including it. All right, number eight, and this is the most obvious one, the one that the brands are always going to ask for, your rate card. Now, everybody has a different approach to this. And let's be honest, this is a really gatekept topic in the industry. People do not like disclosing their rates. People do not like talking about what they charge 
for a post or for a package or for, you know, whatever. That I'm going to save for a future episode. It is a topic we could go so deep on and have a large conversation on. But all you need to know for the media kit portion of this is I recommend twofold. One, having an a la carte version. So a version where a brand can come to you and they say, hey, we want an Instagram post. Great. Here's my a la carte rate card. For one Instagram post, it's going to be X amount of dollars. And it's not that deep. Like, keep it simple. However, the part two to this and what I recommend once you get a little further along is creating packages. So if it makes sense, there could be a world where you say, hey, I know you just asked for one deliverable on my Instagram feed, but what about if I also throw in three Instagram stories? Now, this is a benefit to both you and the brand. It gives you the ability to give a discounted package because you're saying, hey, if you commit to a little bit more content, I can discount my rates, but it also is more value to the brand. They're getting more coverage and ultimately creating a more full package and seamless um, integration into your channel. So it works for both players. So again, for the rates, you want to a la carte rates section and then perhaps a package section based on what you think your brands are most interested in from you. Again, it it will truly depend per session. Oh, and I will also say it could be valuable for you to have a separate rate card for exclusivity and brand usage. Again, a conversation for another day. These are like long, extensive terms. I don't know when I became a lawyer. This is like I'm an entertainment lawyer at this point based on all the contracts I've read and all the negotiations I've done. But that's why I'm saying it could be super valuable for you to have a separate rate card for those two portions as well. All right, let's chat about number nine. This is press and press links. So what do I mean by that? And again, you're going to say, Tori, what if I'm just getting started? I have no press press on my name. Okay, no worries. I hear you. But if you have even one press link, I highly recommend including it for a few different reasons. So a press link could mean L Canada, for example, reached out to you and said, hey, we're going to be doing an article on fashion and beauty and we'd love to feature you, Tori, in this article. I, by the way, always say yes to press. Always say yes if a traditional media outlet reaches out to you, be a part of it for two important reasons. One, for this exact reason, so that on your media kit, it legitimizes you. You were working with press sources that are saying, hey, we love Tori's opinion on fashion and on beauty. So we really trust her to to speak on this topic publicly and to our massive audience in the press. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, and again, this is going to feel nuanced, but go with me here. If you're a Canadian creator specifically, you need formal press on your name in order to get a visa to work in the USA. That's just the way it goes. It's a sad reality. Americans can come here and (laughs) do their work with no issues. There is a lot of boundaries for Canadians in general to go work in the US. So what press does for content creators specifically is it is a huge value add when we go to apply for a visa. So you want to make sure that as you get into this industry, and over the years, you're collecting all this traditional press on your name. So by the time you go and apply for a visa, they say, oh yeah, she's unique in her craft. She's beyond fabulous in her craft. We can, we can green light a visa. So that's the second reason why collecting press and press links is super important. I should clarify what I mean by press is traditional press. So newspaper outlets or um, any like broadcast portfolio, because what happens when you go to apply for a visa is they trust those sources. These are these are now sources that they say, oh, we understand this green check mark. Whereas things like TikTok or things like podcasts, all still great and all still press and promotion for you, but just it's new media. And sometimes we need to rely on the traditional media in order to support us. So this is a great way to include it in your media kit and create more value for those potential brand partners. Okay. And the final magical thing that everybody forgets about, nobody includes, and to me is one of my favorite parts of my media kit. And this is testimonials from past clients. Now, if you have trusted sources and people in the industry that you know are going to put in a good word for you, this is your perfect opportunity to leverage that relationship. This is again, a piece of advice that I got from players in the industry and people that just know this industry inside out. They said, get testimonials from amazing global partners and clients and people that want to work with you. And I said, genius, this is so smart. So I went to really trusted sources, people I knew that had had great experiences working with me, but also people that have 
clout in the industry. Like don't go to your older sister who works in marketing and be like, hey, can you write like a testimonial for me? Don't do that. Make sure it's valuable. Go to someone that either you were an intern for or someone that you had an awesome campaign with or someone you created awesome results for. And again, it doesn't have to be long-winded, but just, hey, Tori's a pleasure to work with. I would recommend her to any brand out there. She's a surefire way to create awesome results for your client. And I would, you know, I, I, I can't say enough good things. Like it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. But you do want to make sure that it's coming from people that have some clout. So like some cool brands that you think would be a great fit to have that signage on your media kit. Okay, so those are my 10 tips for your media kit. And what I could also do for this episode maybe is add some little screenshots from my own media kit. I don't know who I think I am giving up all this knowledge, but um, it might be it might be cool to see it visually. And I myself am a visual learner, so I can get um, my producer James to include some little snippets so you guys can kind of see a little behind the scenes of what I currently use to pitch out brands for new business. Because this is a huge part of the business. Like, of course, there's incoming deals, but but being a strong uh, creator also means being a strong advocate for your future work and being able to pitch brands and a media kit is a great tool to do that. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let me know if you want to dive into anything deeper on that list. We will do an episode based on rates and exclusivity and usage. So don't worry about that. I will come back to you with more, more information and tea there. But until then, I love you, mean it. See you in the next episode. Bye. 